Introducing Joseph Akanya. He is the senior pastor of Daylight Worship Center, Lagos. A prophet and teacher with the mandate to teach people the undiluted word of God. He travels extensively around the world to fulfill this mandate. Many refer to him as one of the few true and unstained prophets in the body of Christ today. He is the convener of healing and prophecy, an outreach in which he ministers healing to the total man through the prophetic word, which holds annually in several states in Nigeria, Ghana, and South Africa. In 2006, Joseph Akanya started Saints in Business Network International for believers in the marketplace. And in 2018, the Acts 13 Network for pastors and ministers. His book, Fulfilling Your Prophetic Destiny, was published in 2016, which helps believers discover God's mind and walk in His perfect will for their lives. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joseph Akanya. Hallelujah. Can we put those hands together for the Lord? Amen, 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 amen. I said for the Lord, is it? I said for the Lord. Come on, let's put our hands together for the Lord. Come on, give him a shout. Amen. Give me Psalm 100, verse 1, in the message. <laughs> I'm sure you have the message. If you don't have the message, the church is not complete. Because that's the message. <laughs> Praise the Lord. On your feet now. Are you on your feet so nobody's sitting? Okay. Applaud God. Applaud God. Get excited and applaud Him. We are in the winning team, my friends. We are winning team. We are in the winning team. Come on, applaud him. Glory. Hallelujah. The next thing he said there is bring a gift of laughter. <laughs> Listen to me. Is the Bible we are practicing? You know? <laughs> Glory. Praise God. Now listen to me. Anytime you have the opportunity to laugh before God. It means God is at work. It means God has gone to war. Because when God loves, that God deals with his enemy. It's not when he's angry. In fact, when God is angry, there's a tendency that he will be merciful. <laughs> so anything that does not resemble God in your life, as you laugh, they are clear enough. Will you laugh with me, my friend? <laughs> Hallelujah. You are wondering what are we doing? My friends, we are obeying scripture. He said you should bring an offering. Some of you brought money, but you didn't bring laughter. So we are just giving him laughter. You say, what will he do with it? He will use it to turn your situation around. Yeah. Psalm 123 says, when the Lord, 26 says, when the Lord turned again our captivity, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue with singing. Then said, ye among the hidden, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. He said, turn again our captivity, O Lord, like the streams in the south. And then he said, they that sow in tears. What are you sowing? Laughter, you can sow laughter. 
they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. When the Lord, the only God can activate the dead, the when is with God. But the when, I mean, sorry, the, the when is with God, the then is with us. Until God activates the when, you will never experience the then. There must be a when before you experience the then. So we just need God to activate the when. When? Now. So if it is now, it means we are going to now start experiencing every other thing in our life. He said, then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Our mouth was filled with laughter. Why? Because we are in the... No, the then. Because God has already activated the when. This program is packaged by God to activate the when. So that you can experience the then. Hallelujah. So welcome to the then. I say, welcome to the den. I say, welcome to the den. It's not going to take any other time again because it's already now. It's happening right now. In my life, it's happening now. This is the when. This is the den. God has activated the when and we are in the den. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of God. Angelic activities. I keep talking about angelic activities. Angels are here. My prayer is that you will see them like I see them. I pray the prayer that, uh, what's his name, prayed. Um, Elisha was the one that prayed for Gehazi. He said, God, open his eyes that he may see. Because <laughs> when the enemy came around to them, a host of army, and they were wondering, you know, everybody thought, well, Elisha, his mouth is too big. Today he's in trouble. But you know what Elisha did? Elisha was so comfortable that he was resting. Why? Because of what he knew. And that's why there are things you will know that will make you comfortable and relax. It doesn't matter what is happening. But if you don't have that knowledge, you will be in trouble. That's why, like I said yesterday, one thing you must look out for is what is God doing? What is God up to? If you have that information, you will relax. And then he prayed for Gehazi because Gehazi came to him and said, Master, we're in trouble. Come, 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 come and see. They are all around us. And Elisha said, well, those who are for us are more than those who are against us. But he prayed and said, God, open his eyes. And when the man saw, he discovered there were more angels that if any one of them should try, Probably there are more, not just two angels, because the Bible says he saw a host. Hallelujah. Every time the Bible refers to God as the God of hosts, he's talking about the God of angels. Praise the Lord. And I just want to remind you again that today, God will manifest himself to us in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alright, today I want to bring God's perspective. I'm not teaching about the reward of a prophet. I'll just bring God's perspective about what he has said to us from the first night. God said in this meeting, he is resetting seasons. You remember? He's inducing seasons. And then he's also releasing seasons. And as a result of that, we experience acceleration. He is resetting things and we discover to reset means to set back to the initial state or to adjust again after an initial failure after an initial failure to adjust again after and what initial failure let that sink in you i don't know what you are filled in but god is resetting the order he wants you to start all over again. So you, you think, oh, will I ever have this opportunity again? God wants to start it all over. God is not just a God of one chance. In Lagos, if you say one chance, we understand what. <laughs> God is not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. I remember that I was traveling a long time ago. That was earlier, you know, when we, we were in Lagos. <laughs> and I had to travel by a morning bus. I was going to, I think I was going to Uyo to minister. <laughs> Late uh, 90s. And so, you know, boarded the bus around mile two. I needed to get to a place called Mazamaza Maza because I needed to, that's where I, I pick. I think I was going to board uh, a morning bus and it was the young operating, these uh, luxurious buses, but they had a morning eye because I didn't want to go with the night. And uh, in my heart, I didn't have an issue. I like to check my heart every time I'm traveling <laughs> because if I don't have it, there's no reason to go. So I want to be sure that I have it. Um, recently, or two, last year, the year before last, before the pandemic, that's 2019, I think it is January, but um, the man had been speaking to me to come host a meeting in UK. And so, we were all planning. Now, I'm just you know, diving into another story. I'll come back to this. Don't forget, I didn't, rem I didn't forget the story I was giving you, or the testimony I was telling you about that brother that had 800 million. Okay, I'll conclude it today. It's because as I went on, the Lord said, it's okay. Keep that by the side. So I will share it today. I didn't have the release to continue. But I will tell you that today. All right? Now, so, um, he asked me if I could come minister for him. And I said, it's okay. Through one of our, you know, uh, friends. Uh, but, you know, he's a mentor also to us. Dr. Kafia, for those who know him in Uyo. Uh, he's a well-known, you know, man of God there very simple. He's also a pastor. All right. And uh, he, he actually asked me that he would really love me to go to this guy's church. That I will really help them. I say, really? <laughs> he said, yeah. So the guy, you know, put a call through and then eventually we arranged everything was going on fine. We're going to go to UK to go minister in his church. And then the uh, he spoke to me about the month of September. October came past. November came. Towards the end of November, I kept, you know, struggling. It was like, Hi, this is not my meeting. This is not my meeting. So I was wondering, I said, God, what do I do? I kept, you know, God did, I, it's not as though God spoke to me, but by the inward weakness, I just knew that was in my, my meeting. I kept having struggle in me. Now, every time you have those things, it's God trying to show you that thing you are planning to do, leave it alone. Change uh, direction. And sometimes we just change direction without asking, Lord, what next? You don't just change direction. You don't, okay, if this one doesn't work, okay, it must be this. Kenneth Higgins made that mistake. He thought, well, when Jesus said to him, well, you are not called to be a pastor. He just said, okay, fine. If it's not pastor, it must be evangelistic. So he went to doing evangelism. So eventually things were tight again. <laughs> And for in his own words, he said, it's like you wearing the socks, with, you know, that is wet. It's like you wearing wet socks on your shoe. You know how com in, uncomfortable it can be. So finally, he kept pushing in the spirit and praying and asking God. And then the Lord said to him, Mr. Man, I never called you to be an evangelist. So he was wise now to say, Lord, if it's not pastor and evangelist, then what is it? Then the Lord now told him. You say, ah, God should know. Now he should tell me. No, sometimes you need to push on God. All right? And say, God, what are you really saying? If it's not this, which one is it? So eventually I was able to summon the courage. And the man kept calling, you know. So one day I just told him, and I said, I don't know how to say this, you know. But really, I don't have a release. It looks like that meeting is not mine. And the guy kept quiet for a while. And then he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I agree with you. That even me, I've been having that struggle. But I didn't know how to say it to you. So I say, thank you. Have a wonderful meeting without me. Enjoy yourself. So he told me, anytime God gives you the release, please let us know. We really want to have you here. And I said, no trouble. Let's see. So when the pandemic came, I knew that was in the air. Hallelujah. And I'm not sure I will go this year. So, let's see how that develops. And I, I said that because I wanted you to do that. That in that morning, I woke up, you know, boarded a bus that was taking me to, from mile two, which will drop me in mile two, and my, uh, Maza Maza is just the next bus stop. All right? And uh, I boarded that uh, yellow bus. 
All right? And while I was in it, I didn't have any, you know, any restraint. I didn't have a, a leading not to travel that morning. Uh, and I just waved the, 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 the bus, the yellow bus. They, they picked me in. But the only thing I discovered is that I was the only one that they picked because I had the bag. <laughs> That's what you call one chance. So I sat down comfortably. Then I noticed there were like two or three people behind. There were other people. And then one of them brought out a gun and said, um, who are you? We want to know who you are. I said, really? I don't know. I was so relaxed. I said, you want to know? I said, I'm a pastor. I'm traveling. He said, you are a pastor. I said, yes. They say, ah, don't touch him. <laughs> because that would have spoiled their trouble. That day they would have been arrested. So one said, no, you know, before they asked me that, one said, bring out your gold. I said, I don't, I don't, I don't use gold. They said, okay, bring out your phone. Or no, you know, bring out your, bring out your money. I said, what I have here cannot meet your need. They say, who are you? I say, I'm a pastor. Traveling to Uyo. They said, where is your church? I say, in Surulere. I say, you can be part of that church too if you want to. <laughs> now, immediately say, I'm a pastor. The guy, their leader stopped. He said, don't touch him. I hope you have not collected anything from me. If you collect, return it back. I'm telling you, they didn't take anything from me. So, they had passed my, you know, bus stop where I needed to stop Maza Maza. They took me, you know, close to first tax, second gate. Then they said, they, they apologized. They said, sorry, do you know your way back to Maza Maza? That please, we will drop you here. By this time, I saw some people that they have, you know, like handcuffed, more or less. You know, so they dropped me there and said, please, I just should just cross over to the other side and then pick a bus that will take me. That's my experience with one chance. <laughs> but it was a good experience. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now I said that because of what I said. Praise the Lord. But God has many, many chances. Not only one. When I say chance, I'm not referring to one chance. Okay. God has many opportunities that he brings around us. If not, from the moment the children of Israel failed God, God should have given up on them. But God didn't. That's why he'll keep sending prophets to them, even when they have sinned, to correct them, to align them, so that they will repent and come back to God. And then God again will bring them into his blessing and the promises that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Praise the Lord. So today I want to teach on God's perspective about what he said to us, that this meeting is about reset, induce, and release, which will bring us to a season or a time of acceleration. Praise the Lord. Amen? To induce uh, simply means to cause to happen. That's what I got from the dictionary, not from the Spirit of God. I just read that out and saw it there. It means to cause to happen. One of the meanings I got, and I felt I, I was comfortable with that. Whenever, you know, a woman is pregnant and there's a delay in, the, in that pregnancy, in, in delivery, one of the things doctors will recommend to do is to induce that labor so that there can be what? Contraction. And then you can bring forth. So some of these things is what God is going to do. Release. I was looking at the dictionary. It wasn't giving me. I said, Lord, give me insight. And then God said to me, the release is actually. <laughs> Let me look at what he said, the way he said it. He said, release is to launch people. It's to launch people. The best way he described that to me, he said, have you seen the rocket being launched? That's released. They are releasing that rocket. They have held it for a while, but it's time to release. And you know what? When you release a rocket, it gains speed as it progresses. It accelerates as it progresses. And so you keep seeing it. And before you know, you find out that 
you know, is running faster than a normal, the best plane, the fastest plane. A rocket runs faster than the fastest plane. One day God told me, he said, the slowest plane is better, is faster than the fastest car. That's true. One of the slowest maybe planes you'll find are propeller planes. But they are still faster than your car. If you have to fly from here to Lagos, or you have to drive from here to Lagos, you know how many hours you are going to be driving. Even if there's nobody on the road, if you like, run 260 or 80 kilometers per hour. Don't try it, oh. not in Nigerian road. Because even overtaking people on the highway is trouble. You just find somebody who just will stay on the fast lane instead of going to the other lane. It just stays there and then you have to overtake by the right and then you come to the left and then you go to the right. It's always, you know, uninteresting when you drive on our highway because there are many people who don't even understand traffic rules. We just drive anyhow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, they were coming. And, you know, on this uh, old airport junction or roundabout, now you people have changed it to roundabout. It used to be old airport junction. I know it's still a junction, but it's a roundabout. And the way some people were driving, you could see some people, even those who were supposed to stop, are putting their... They are driving like... People are now driving like Lagos people. Everybody's a Lagosian now. Praise the Lord. The first wonder for us in Lagos is that when you see people gathered... Lagos is normal. When you see few, Mister, ask question. Start going back home. If you go to Oshodi and you see few people there, my friends, just know there's trouble. You don't need to continue. But if you see everywhere, everywhere is just bubbling and people are just moving everywhere. Just know, ah, things are normal. So I remember when we came back for campfire that year, my wife said, there's something wrong with Joss. I said, there's nothing wrong. What is wrong is that the number of people you saw in Lagos <laughs> compared to what you are seeing here <laughs> is nothing. Praise the Lord. I said, okay, oh, that's the reason. That's the reason. Yeah, that's the reason. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I didn't like Lagos, but if you are called to a place, eventually you wear the city. Because if you don't, you can't minister to them. Praise the Lord. Going back to Lagos, I can arrive Lagos 12 midnight, 1 a.m., 2 p.m., I mean 1, 1 p.m. or 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 5 a.m. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I'm excited to arrive at that time. There are many people who say, ah, Lagos, don't arrive later. No, for me, it's home. We just enter. It doesn't matter where I go to. When I arrive Lagos, I'm just going back home. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not scared of Lagos. Lagos is scared of me. Because we are walking in the will of God. Praise the Lord. Alright, let me share, finish that testimony. So, <clears throat> I ministered to that brother in, in Port Harcourt, in that church. Uh, you know, and I met one of the brothers that came around. I don't know if he's still around. The pastor, the other, I saw that pastor on Friday. The pastor from Calabar, right? Uh, who said, the, so, the daughter, you know, of that pastor that we ministered for, is actually the worship leader or one of the worship leaders in, in his church now. You know, so when we mention the name, that's why you confirm this thing because he now can go back to confirm from the pastor if what we have said is true. That's why we mention names sometimes, not that it's necessary to mention the names of people. So that if people are here, they, either the pastor will say, the man is lying. It's not true. Nothing like that happened. Praise the Lord. So, the word of God, this brother was in, in redeemed church. He was going to redeem, but he came for that meeting. So in a year's time, God multiplied, um, you know, financial, um, financially to him. Well, God increased him financially, and he became so, so wealthy. He moved, got, he, in his own words, said he made 800 million naira. Because he had contract, something to do with Shell, and then started working with Shell, and then from there, God just expanded him. And so one of those times, we went back and um, he bought a car, very expensive car. And he brought the car to me to, to show me. And the Lord said to me, tell him that is not his car. That he should give the car out now. And God told him who he should give the car to. 
I didn't know that he didn't settle well with the brother. So later, he came to me privately and said, ah, Pastor, that you know I bought this car, I've suffered. Though. I said, well, but you need to follow God that when God instructs you, just do what he says. It's as simple as that. If God could raise you from nothing to 800 million. But you know, sometimes, even when God promotes us, greed does not leave us home. You need to deal with greed. Everybody has an element of greed, except you have dealt with it. If you don't deal with it, it will de you know, greed will deal with you. We hinder you from entering into dimensions of God. Wells, all right, rivers, financial river, if you like, or rivers. So you will need to deal with that so that you obey God, not based on what you have in your hand or what you think of oh, this thing, they won't be able to use it well. And so this brother didn't do that. And then uh, came back the following year, he was in that meeting. But this time, they had, um, he had an accident with that car. He had a car, uh, car crash. And this, his legs, one of his legs was amputated. And so he came to see me and was trusting God if God could bring a new leg. I said, you think saying that so God they walk? I said, you know the reason why that happened? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I didn't obey God. I said, fine. It's not your car. Don't let your car kill you. Don't let the gift. I was talking about, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the widow of Zarephath who had something, uh, you know, meal and said, we'll eat it, my son and I, and then we'll die. So there's some things that can kill you. Don't eat it. Send it on. If you know you are going to die by that gift or by, by that resource or the resources or by that uh, gift in your life, why don't you send it away so that you don't die? Praise the Lord. Because if the woman had not given the prophet, she would have died. Truly. She didn't even need to eat the food. She would have still died. Or she would have, you know, died. But blessed be God. So this brother eventually, you know, came and saw me and I said, well, it's well. I, I can't pray. I don't know if I should pray such prayer. But I trust God with you that you have learned. And that you will still walk with God. So he has one leg. And then he got, uh, uh, what do you call? Yes, artificial. And then it was given to him. But he's doing well. He returned back to God and was walking with God. And God still blessed him. But the one leg is to show him, to remind him of his disobedience. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't want to walk that way. I want to walk with God so that everything is intact. All right. Praise the Lord. So I finished the testimony. But the brother is fine. Amen. The last time I saw him, he had relocated to U.S. So he's in U.S. now and he's doing well. I have not, I'm, I've lost contact with him. But I want to believe that he's doing well. Praise the Lord. And he has a ministry too, eventually, you know, moved into ministry as pastoring. Praise the Lord. All right. Praise God. Let me begin my teaching today. I just um, thank you so much, Pastor Dunka. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Elizabeth. We call her Eli. I said, okay, I, I wish I could talk. Maybe not today, except you are going to be with me later. Then I will talk about what I mean. I can't say everything. But I used to know that. Um, their family house then used to be our, our breeding ground. So what I am doing now, majorly part of it started there. We just come, I think on a Sunday after service, we'll, come. They'll give us meal, we eat. When we finish eating, we pray. When we pray, we have words for people. So we keep distributing the words as they are coming. <laughs> Hallelujah. So far back then, I, I have known her. Praise the Lord. And I used to call her then that I didn't know, but it's a prophetic thing. It just came from my mouth that she's a mother. And you will testify that she is in this church. All right. So she has the grace of God upon her to do what she's doing. Praise the Lord. How many of you love her? Because if you don't love her, just know that you are the ones that, that I will relocate. <laughs> and then I will... <laughs> I will take you out of here to another place. By the time you notice that you don't have a mother like her, you will run back. But I hope by then people have not taken your seat. 
That's why it's not good to leave when you don't have understanding stay. You don't leave because of misunderstanding. Because by the time you now understand and you return, somebody has taken your place. Praise the Lord. Now, it's not right for people to leave just because you have some. If you don't have, just stay there. God, if God has not said, because this thing is about God. It's not about how you feel. You say, Pastor insulted me. If you were in the school of, I mean, the church of Jesus, in this crusade, where he was insulting that woman, you said, it's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Ah, if it were other people, eh? so he even called me dog because I came to you. But the woman from what Jesus said, because Jesus wasn't really insulting her, Jesus was teaching and bringing truth out. The woman said, true Lord, which means I caught the revelation. What was the revelation? It's not right to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. That's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 15, you'll find it around verse 25, there about down. The woman said, true Lord, is the truth. What is truth? The revelation of the word of God. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So the woman caught the truth, caught the revelation. He said, true Lord. He said, them, but Lord, you also know that every crumb that falls from the master's table belongs to dogs. Do you expect your children to eat from the crumbs? So if the crumbs is not, is for dogs, there's no how children will eat. And crumbs won't fall. So I am entitled to the crumbs. Jesus said, wow, great is your faith. Did you caught it. If you are always having the wrong mind, anything that is said, you will read meaning to it. But if you came with the right heart, everything that is said, even when somebody is telling you, can you imagine what pastor even said when he was talking to you? He looks like he was insulting you. He said, no, 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 no. You mean you didn't understand what he was saying? That's how to hear and hear accurately. If you can't hear accurately, you can't receive. Praise the Lord. You know, one way to buy from God is hearing accurately. That's in Isaiah chapter 55. Everyone that thirst, come to the water. He said, come and drink. And then, you know, come and buy. Not with money. Then eventually he says, how do you come to buy? He said, incline your ear. He said, hearken. Which means listen. It is through listening and hearing accurately, appropriately, that you begin to buy from God. It's not your money that you use to exchange things or healing whatsoever it is that God can do in your life it is your hearing because you must hear him that's why we read yesterday in 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1 when Elisha came the Bible says and Elisha said hear ye the word of the Lord thus before he said thus saith the Lord he said hear ye the word of the Lord which means get your ears open to hear what I'm about to say so that I can benefit you one way to receive a prophet is also through hearing because Majorly, prophets operate by singing. Not really by... They can act, but even when they act, it's because they have heard. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 9, give me verse 8, please. Let me begin my teaching today. Today, I want to show you from scripture, because as God spoke to me, I said, God, give me an evidence. Give me a, a scripture that I can use to... Uh, you know, explain this message that you have given to me. Reset. Induce. Release. Or launch. To launch you into another dimension. So you are like that rocket that God is about to launch. And when God launches you until you get to your target. Have you ever seen? Well, except if there's a mistake. Majorly. Every time there's a launching of rocket or when a rocket is launched, the major, the major reason, the purpose is for them to land where they have sent it to. So it will land either in the moon, the orbit, wherever it is that they have sent it to. And they just go land there. But you see, it is calculated. That's why they don't take it from everywhere. Alright? Praise the Lord. 
So God has calculated everything and has just made this weekend your launching pad. I just want to launch you, catapult you to the next level. Hallelujah. That's why we are here. So be patient today. You will arrive there. God will launch you. The most important thing is make sure you receive the launch. Make sure God launches you. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter, what did I say? Nine. God's perspective is what I want to bring to you so that you can run with understanding. Hallelujah. The Lord sent a word into Jacob and it, the word, had lighted upon who? Israel. The Lord had sent a word or the Lord sent a word into Jacob it had lighted upon Israel so today I'm going to be talking to you about Lake, uh, Jacob because he experienced reset induce release and that brought him into acceleration so I will use him because that's what God you know showed me from scripture now, the Bible says God sent a word into Jacob. The Bible didn't say God sent words. God sent the word. Kenny Copeland is the one. He said one word from God can change your life. Just one. Just God singing one thing. You, you don't need God to say many things. So God can just say healing. And that will change your entire landscape. Your entire life is changed by just God's mentioning to you and you receiving it and you are just hearing healing. Which means everything you read, you understand healing with every other thing. For you who don't have understanding, you think healing is just about body parts. So you say, eh, but I am not sick now. Can God be talking about healing? But you see, God is not talking about healing only for your body. And then when God mentions healing, and sometimes that's the prophetic thing, God can be talking about healing that I will heal you. And you are wondering, ah, this man of God, no get more. Is because God saw that there's a serious sickness that is coming. So he gave you a word before he came. I went to minister to a man, uh, you know, in, in the hospital. No, not in the hospital. Before the man went to the hospital. But this man is in Port Harcourt, And then the word of God came to him in their church. And then I spoke to him and I, the word of God told him about things that he was going to do and, you know, what have you. Then the man, you know, became sick. Seriously sick. He was admitted. Doctors were not sure if he would make it out of, out of the hospital. And then in the midst of that, you know, wondering if he would make it. So eventually they got in contact with me, called me and said, Man of God, that your friend is sick. And we want you to pray. I was about to pray. Then he came to me. I said, what did God say to him the other time? Do you still have that message in, in place? They said, oh, we didn't write it. I said, go and check your church library or your, you know, your, your, your multimedia, whatsoever it is, if it was recorded. And it was recorded. Thank God he got the message. I said, you should be listening to it. So he started listening to it. He started listening. I said, what did God say? So they called me the second day. They said, well, what God said was that he was going to do this, but he has not attain, attained it. I said, then it's a sign that the sickness will come and go. They said, Pastor, won't you pray? I said, there's no reason to pray because God who saw ahead didn't talk about the sickness and disease. So he should hold on to the word of God. And the man was listening to the word of God day and night, morning and evening. Kept listening to the word of God until the word of God sank into him. And then eventually, he came out of the hospital. The same doctors that say he will die. Whatsoever they discovered, they couldn't find anymore. And he went back to his work and continued his work and kept doing what God said and kept building. I was reading after one known prophet in America. His name is Bill Hammond. Bill Hammond said the only person he prophesied to, or the only woman, you know, that came to him and said, man of God, everything God has spoken through you has come to pass, and God has not said anything new. He said, died the following year. Because if God is not speaking to you, sir, the end of your life has come. Which means God is simply saying you are finished. But as long as God is still speaking, that's why I tell people, how do you know you will live long? As long as God has said things that has not come to pass yet, it means you are still having it. As long as you are holding to it, oh, mm, that's what it means. It means you are still going to be living. So he said, there are things God has said to me. I know it won't happen in the next five years. So I know there's more. I have more 
more, more than five years to my life. There are things God has said that won't happen until I know in my mind, you know, from my understanding. It won't happen in the next 15 years. Hallelujah. But you also know the good news. If you are walking with God, there's no reason why God, Jesus, the head of the church, should be speaking to you. And he's going to come tomorrow. So that's one way I get to know that Jesus is not coming now. Because he can't be speaking. How can I be telling you about what I'm going to do in your life tomorrow and then I'm sacking you today? It doesn't sound right. Am I communicating? Thank you. So if God is still speaking to you, it means one, you still have a long way to go. Because if God fulfills everything he says to you now, and he's not saying anything, my friends, begin to prepare. Your time is up. But as long as he's still, he's still, still speaking to you, and he keeps saying, you know, things that you know are still in the future. Uh, let me share this with you. Recently, recently, sometime last year, sometimes you know some things, but you don't have concrete understanding until later. Until God gives you insight. So I had understanding later that, you know, when God speaks to you, God speaks in three, in three folds or in three dimensions. God, every prophetic word can either be short term, mid term, or long term. You will need to understand that. Short term simply means now, which means if God should talk to you now, it will happen either now, which was almost immediately, or up till one year. Which means anything God says to you that happens within a year is short term. Anything above one year, that's mid term. That can take till 10 years or above 10 years. Anything above one year to 10 years is short term. Anything above 10 years is long term. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. It will help you to know so that you don't think there are some words you have, they won't happen in the next one year. Not because, so if you understand it, that's why you need to pray to understand. When you understand it, you just know, see, this thing has an allotted time, has an appointed time for them to happen. So you relax. Do you get what I'm saying to you? Daniel said, I understood by books. The book of Jeremiah. How did he know? He was studying the book of the prophecy of Jeremiah and then had understanding that, hey, hey, we are supposed to be here for 70 years and it looks like 70 years is about to elapse. So he started pushing in the spirit and started waging war by the word of prophecy and it came to pass. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? So you need to understand which one is short term, which one is long term, which one is mid term. If you understand that, it will help you and will help you with how you relate with that word of prophecy. Praise the Lord. All right, so God sent a word into who? Jacob. Who did God send the word to? Jacob. But the Bible says the word lighted upon who? Israel. Another translation says God sent a word to Jacob. But it rested upon Israel. Another one says it, it happened on Israel. God's focus was not Jacob. But that word needs to go through Jacob so that Israel can come forth. Jacob was hiding Israel. But Israel is what God needed. God wanted to use, not Jacob necessarily. So today let's go to Jacob and study some things from Jacob. Hallelujah. Let's see this experience in detail. Genesis chapter 32 verse 24. I just begin to read from verse 24. I read it till Genesis chapter 33, verse 1, I mean, to 4. Genesis chapter 20, I'm sorry, 32, verse 24 till the end. And then I'll continue till Genesis 33, verse 1 to 4. I'm sure you understand. Praise the Lord. And Jacob was left alone. Every time you are left alone, find out the reason. I didn't say every time you are lonely. <laughs> okay. 
there are seasons of life uh, that we can use to describe the seasons of the spirit. Example, in this part of the world, we only have two major seasons. That's the one we understand. Dry season, wet season or rainy season. Dry season, rainy season. So now you say we're in dry season. Very soon we enter rainy season. That's all we know. But in places like Europe and some part of the world, they have four seasons. They have um, winter, autumn, spring, summer. And it is amazing that every of these four seasons spiritually also happens to us. So you need to know what season am I? Now, summer is the peak of activity. That's why you hear even we that don't talk about summer in Nigeria. We say we are going for summer. People are going abroad. They say we are going for summer. <laughs> summer is when people travel. Activity, you, you know, at the peak of activity during summer. Everybody is there. Boop, 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 boop. They are traveling. But you know what? Winter is where everything is quiet. Recently, America just went through a terrible time, you know, or terrible, terrible winter. That even in, the, uh, you know, in, in Houston, snow. In how many years? They have never seen snow. There are children that were giving birth to their grew and never experienced snow all their life. They just saw it for the first time. It was so terrible. Some of our friends are still there and they were calling us, hey, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us, pray for us. Because, see, it was so cold that some of them had to come inside the car. Five hours because there was no light, no power, power outage. So they would turn on the heater in the car and stay there for five hours to warm, warm themselves. It was that terrible. Praise the Lord. So I told them, I said, Thank God. God did not send me at this time. This is not the best time to come to America. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because I know some of you, even with the cold in jaws, you will run home. May you not experience winter in Joss. I mean the real winter. When you have snow. It can be terrible. Praise the Lord. Now, <clears throat> so we need to understand the seasons. That the seasons of life also explains we can learn from the seasons of life. So, uh, uh, you know, during winter, everything is just quiet. School sometimes, if it's serious, um, you know, if it's that serious, they shut down schools, shut down many things. People don't go to work. You are just indoors. Now, at that time, activity is slow. Do you know we go through that in our lives? Now, listen to me, and I want you to understand this. The seasons of the spirit, they change. Just like we have different seasons, when it is summer, you find out that activity, without even you praying, God has moved into, things just start happening around you. And you are wondering, ah, why, you know, before you do this, another thing is happening and, and things like that. But the time comes where everything is slow. It doesn't mean you have sinned. It only means you need to understand. You know, I, I learned this a long time ago, that when money starts coming into your hand, it is time to save and plan. So, save invest for the next time because based on what God revealed to Pharaoh who, that Joseph interpret, he said there were seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. Those seasons come. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. You will experience it. So you need to know what season you are. When money is coming, you say, ha, praise God, you start buying things. Hey, you are wasting time. Oh, you are wasting money. Because a season is going to come that will be called a season of famine. Either you like it or not. It happens. You can't change it. And so when it comes, it is what you have done during the time of harvest that will sustain you during famine. And then you enter again into abundance. And then abundance open up to famine. These things keep happening. If you check your life, you find that it's so. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? So, it will look like you are up today. Not necessarily that God has forsaken you. But you see, God is teaching you how to operate. You remember I said something 
that one of our friends taught us. He says, this earth is regulated by principles, not by miracles. God does not always want you to. If God keeps doing miracles only for you, you won't learn anything. Wind falls. If that's what you're expecting, every time, oh God, just bring the breakthrough. No. When God brings breakthrough, you should also think just like that woman did. Think about it and then take time, okay, take time and, you know, think deep and know what God is trying to speak to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's good to, the best investment you can make is to sow into God's work and his men. But, after you have done that, also look for something you can invest into. Are you following me? There's no reason for you to live your life without having something. In, in, you know, there's, there's what is known in the financial world that your money is generating resources for you. Your money is working for you. That's what they say. So you can make your money work for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? You can invest. Pray to God. He will show you what you can invest into. Praise the Lord. Are you with me, sir? Uh -huh. And you can start investing from now. You don't have to be old to invest. You can be a younger person and start investing. And you now build it and build it and build it and build it and build it. Praise the Lord. You know, for forever and ever, our Lord's children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren can never lack because his investment in Coca-Cola, he brought Coca-Cola to Nigeria. So as long as there's Coca-Cola, and you know Coca-Cola will not die tomorrow. I don't see which company wants to kill Coca-Cola now. They have been there for over, I think over 60 years now or so. I think recently I was watching, they say in Nigeria, I think, over 60 years. So, you can imagine that that company is waxing strong. Is there any village that they don't have Coca-Cola? In fact, do you know even when we want to drink Sprite or Fanta, we say Coke. Then when they bring the Coke, you say, no, 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 I mean Fanta. You generalize it, you call everything Coke. There's no part of the world that you go to that you don't find Coke, that they don't know Coke. Do you get what I'm saying to you? But the man had foresight and bought shares in that company. So you need to pray to God to give you insight and foresight so that you can buy into certain companies. You can invest. When you see investment opportunity, you cash into it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that you don't live your life from hand to mouth. Hand to mouth. And every time, you are always trusting God for a breakthrough financially. All your life. Every time we meet you, I'm just trusting God for breakthrough. If God can just break it through. And like Pastor Bakari will say, he says some breakthrough is actually breakdown. I prefer break forth. I don't like breakthrough because breakthrough is one di directional. All right? But break forth is multi. It's multi-directional, which means from everywhere. That's why I say you will break forth to the right and to the left. And you will inherit the, gen, the, you know, the, the resources of the Gentiles. So there's break forth. Above breakthrough is break forth. So me, I prefer, I prefer break forth than breakthrough. Thank God for breakthrough. God may start you from breakthrough. But don't stay there. Invest. Invest. That's what the prophet suggested to that woman. Go and invest. Don't spend the money. Don't eat everything. Live on it, but don't live first. Settle your debt and live on the rest. The woman started a business from nowhere. Just a bottle. Do you know if that woman had come earlier to Elisha, her husband would not have died? Because she had had the oil while the man was alive. And that oil, that bottle of oil would have been what would have, you know, uh, taken them out of debt. The husband died because every money they are bombarded. Hey, you have not paid us our money. So even when the man wants to pray, when somebody hits your house, that prayer will disappear. If you are owing your landlord, I don't know if you'll be able to pray well. 
and he comes, bong, 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 bong. you know your landlord has come. And you'll still be there. If you are praying, what you are praying is unbelief. You actually be saying, God, kill him, Lord. Deal with him, Lord. Don't make him come again. Hallelujah. But you can deliver yourself from that. Praise the Lord. One, don't borrow. When, you know, the Bible says, I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 12, if I'm not mistaken, no, verse 12, 13, and 14, thereabout. He says, Thou shalt not borrow. He said, Thou shalt lend to many nations. Thou shalt not borrow. I read that scripture, and what I heard is, Thou shalt not borrow. Is a command. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Is a command. Thou shalt not borrow. Is a command. Which means, before you borrow, Take permission from me. If he says yes, go ahead. But Young Cho, now David Young Cho, was building their first ch uh, church in, in uh, South Korea, you know, in Seoul. And then he said the Lord asked him to go because they had a bank manager or something, you know, in their church. And God said he should go talk to them so that they can borrow. And he said, Lord, are you sure? So he went and talked to the man. The man said, okay, no problem, we can borrow. And so they borrowed to build that church. Part of the money, they borrowed it. And they were able to offset it. Now, so we need to know when and when not to. It doesn't mean because God said, said it yesterday, today, you also automatically just, ah, God allowed me the other day now. I just go ahead. No, that may be your trouble. Am I communicating? Because the Bible says, the borrower is what? Servant to, to the lender. So you will always be serving. That's why when you see him coming, you'll be running. Am I communicating? Praise the Lord. My brother, your debt will be cancelled supernaturally. The things you are owing and the things you have invested in that has not produced will bring forth for you now. Hallelujah. I just said that and pam, it became so real to me that I'm speaking to you. Alright, so death, don't, don't get into death if God asks him. Me, I like to ask God for everything. Even marriage, as sim you know, even eating food. If I have not eaten something before, Lord, will this food be nice for me to eat? I have choices, not that they are forcing it on me. If I go for mission, it's a different thing. I went to Bakim Cooking in, in, uh, in, uh, <laughs> in Kandinkom village here. Went to minister there, and they cooked all one kind of soup. Everything that was, was in it, the other, no meat, nothing. Everything was just that, that black soup. We ate it joyfully. Enjoyed it. So that the people won't think, this man of God, is he really sent to us? If you are sent, you must accept the people. You must go fully. So that your ministry can make impact there. If not, if they begin to say, so one of the pastors, you know, recently followed me to Abakaliki. He said, Abakaliki. Abakaliki. Went to minister there. So one of the pastors that followed me, just like Pastor Steve followed me here. They brought uh, Alpha with uh, Mfi, Periwinkle. And the man said, Kai, that he doesn't eat it all. I said, Mr. Man, you follow me. Anything I eat, you eat. <laughs> he said, okay, how do we eat it? Because he came with the shell. He said, how do we eat it? I said, you suck it. Take it. Say, ah, this one a punishment too. I say yes. <laughs> it's good punishment. So he sat there. I notice he will suck. Nothing is coming out. He will drop it. I say you have not sucked. He will suck it. <laughs> oh, you say you go follow me. Jesus said if you follow me, take up your cross. And so this is part of the cross you must bear. <laughs> By the time we came back, I said the next time they give you now you eat. You better go and tell your wife to look for Mfi or Periwinkle and cook for you. So that you learn how to eat. If you go to China and they give you those their kind of thing, and you went to minister to them, you better eat it all. <laughs> Hallelujah. May God grant us insight so that we'll know what we can invest in. Do you know there are people in China that are raising cockroaches? And they are billionaires. Because they said medical science discovered there's something in cockroach that can cure certain diseases. I mean the cockroach. Every time you kill cockroach, just don't you are killing money. Hey. <laughs> you are killing serious money. Hey. 
there was a guy we brought to our church who came and was talking about him rearing flies. You remember? In Lagos. He had a farm. Now fly is full there. I said, Mr. Man. He said, ah, he's, the, he, he's money. I said, flies. He said, yeah. So even some things you don't think. He has a farm. Oh, flies. These big, big flies. I love it. Oh. So even the things you discard is money. May God help you to know. So that anytime you want to throw it away. Holy Ghost, talk to me. Let me know. <laughs> so anytime you see yourself killing flies, you are killing money. It's money you are driving away. May God grant us insight. Some things that were not making money in those days are money now. Praise the Lord. Scrap metal. You will throw it away. Plastic, you throw it away. We finish drinking now, we gather it and throw it away. No, we gather it. In Lagos, we gather. We can sell. Even if it is five naira you made from it, you have gained. I'm telling you. So we gather it. That's how to make money. That's one thing I like with Lagos. You open your eyes to see opportunities. Now, this place is not a lazy man's place. You must make money. The first time my wife heard that, you know, I went to, actually I was the one that went and I came and told her. I think eventually she went there. My 12th market. When you enter during rainy season, the place is muddy. And I don't know why they want, I don't know if they have done it now. So you have these ladies that have slippers. You drop your shoe. They'll give you slippers on hire or boot, rain boot. They have umbrella. They have raincoat. You pay them, wear the raincoat, the umbrella and the rain boot. You enter the market, finish buying. You come, drop for them, take your shoe, you pay. And the people are making money. Plenty money. You know how many people come to that market? And then I saw area boys. Any bad road where they know your car will die inside during, during flood. They station themselves. Oga, you want us to push you? If you like, don't pay now. You will remain inside that water because you can't come out of heat and come as... They are there to push. It's an opportunity. That's how you must see opportunity in everything you do. When you are walking, don't close your eyes. Pastor Shola, at this way, he preached a message in our church. He said people, some people are, are, what did he say? How did, are sleepwalking. They are sleepwalking. So while they are walking in the day, their eyes are closed. You need to open your eyes. Look very well. So that you know where are we? Where's the next place? Those are, that's how you locate opportunities. Your eye must be open. I brought a, you know, I went for, for a meeting and there was this man who came there. And the man told me that, ah, pastor, do you know there's so much opportunity here to make money in this church? I said, ah, even in church? He said, yeah. So he told me, he took me to the AC. He said, you see this AC? This AC is not blowing well. But you see, there's something I can do to it. I've learned something to do. I can clean it. And that's, I will make money. He said, but there are people in this church. They, will, they, will, they don't see the opportunity. And they are looking for a job. If you decide to open your church, that's me, after church, pastor, I will be coming for first service. Second service, I will walk. Pastor will not stop you. You see all those cars parked. Just go and create one small place. Be paying rent to church. And say, I want to start car wash. Church members, every Sunday. Pastor, I will come for first service. Second service is the one I won't come. So when I come for first service, second service, I start my own work. So anybody, car wash, international, whatsoever you want to call it. Joseph and Joseph, car wash. As long as pastor allows that and gives me a place. We'll be praying rent though, and not be small rent. Do you see how many cars are parked outside? People who don't have time to go to car wash. They come to church. While they are in service, you are washing their car. Before you know, you start employing people in church. You have more committed people in church. Before you know, that will even bring more people to church. Because there are people that will say, ah, the best car wash in, in just is in covenant word. <laughs> eh? Hey. Ah, so how do they do it? So by the time they bring their car, you will invite them. Go and hear the word of God. While we are doing that, there's a place for you. Are you adding people to church? 
Is that the will of God happening? Are you making money from it? But I think sometimes is that we so close our eyes. Even when God is talking, you say no. I want to walk. In those days, it used to be oil companies. And then it used to be telecom. Now, even the telecom are pushing people there. They are looking, for, they don't want to pay people again. It's contract. Indians in Airtel are looking, it's contract people they are taking. And if you mess up, the, before you know, they, they reduce the, the people. All right? So even that is not paying anymore. But there are other things that are paying. So may God grant you insight to see the opportunities around you. That after this meeting, every opportunity around you, you will locate it. Oh, you didn't say amen. Oh, I said every opportunity around you, you will what? Locate it in the name of Jesus. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled the man with him until the breaking of day. Jacob was left alone and there wrestled with him a man till what? The breaking of day, which means the time will elapse at the break of day. But this man wrestled with him until, which means the time set for everything to happen is break of day. If it doesn't happen at the break of day, the man will con continue perpetually as Jacob. Nothing will happen again in his life. That's where we have come to, sir. Verse, the next verse, please. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. I'm reading on. And he said, let me go for the day, break it. Who said? The man. Let me go for the day, break it. Who invited the man in the first place? Nobody. Did Jacob invite man? Did he ask, hey man, I am expecting you to come. No, no, no. The man was the one who began the wrestling. Or the wrestling match. It wasn't Jacob. Jacob was busy alone. But in his I don't want to use the word in his being lonely, God, through an angel, came to him and started wrestling with him. And then the man will now say, let me go for the day, break it. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Jacob, are you sure? I thought you were already blessed. I thought you just came out of Laban's house and God had blessed you richly because the wealth of Laban was converted to you. So why were, are you still asking for blessing? Because what he's asking for is not financial material blessing. He's asking for something that will make him for life. He's asking for reset, induce, release so that he can accelerate. Destiny defining moment was what he was asking for. Next verse please. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. I'll come back to that but let me read through first. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. That has just happened. For as a prince has thou power with God and with men, and has what? Prevailed, which nobody can hinder you. Nobody can hinder you. from Even God himself can hinder you because you have prevailed with God. You have prevailed with God, which means God has answered all your desires. Everything about you is right with God. And so it will also be right with men. If you have favor with God, you will have favor with men. Sometimes we are looking for favor with men, but we are not looking for favor with God. No, it has to line up according to scripture. Because if you only have favor with men, they will take that favor away the day they are tired with you. But if you have favor with God, my friends, everybody will favor you. The Bible says if your way is right with God, even your own enemies will be at peace with you. When they see you, they say, oh yeah, 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 yeah. We have been looking for you. Your enemies, I mean those who fought you earlier, they are looking for you now. You see that that happened in the life of this man. Next verse, please. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me I pray thee thy name. Since you asked for my own name, I'm now asking for your name. <laughs> and he said, Where, wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. He didn't tell him his name. I learned something from here. I have never, almost every time that I have met angels, I think, I've never seen, angels are not interested in telling you their names. So that they don't take the focus from God to themselves. Jacob asked him, what is your name? He said, who are you to be asking for my name? He blessed him there and left. 
I've seen angels even in this meeting. And I've asked them their names. Not in this meeting, but, you know, some time ago. And every time you ask them their name, they shy away from it. They give you the word of God and go. It didn't register until one day I was, you know, just meditating. Then it came to me that, ah, angels are not interested in introducing themselves. That's not their job. Because if an angel can introduce himself to you, he's taking the focus away from God to himself. Now, and where angels mention a name, you think is the name. Angels don't have name. They have assignments. So when he said, my name is Gabriel, he wasn't saying that is his name, which means this is my assignment. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? So when he comes and says, I'm the angel in charge of resources, that is his name. But that is his work. Or I came to bring healing. That is what he came to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if you see an angel say, my name is Rim Rim. Rim Rim. Just know that. Be careful. Maybe it's an angel of darkness that is trying to appear like the angel of light. Because the Bible says even the devil disguises himself like the angel of light. That's why you don't chase after supernatural things. You chase after the word of God. Chase after, not the spectacular, but the supernatural. The supernatural is the word of God and anything that comes by it. God can appear. God can do spectacular. In this meeting, we're having super, uh, spectacular experiences in this meeting. But listen to me, it won't continue like that. All right? So when you have the spectacular, praise God. But don't expect it to continue. Do you understand what I'm saying? How many times did uh, Moses, you know, strike, or sorry, you know, yeah, strike the water or pointed to the water? How many times did he do that? To the Red Sea? Twice. The first time to part it. The second time. But after then, did you hear that he came back again the next day? He said, ah, God, this power, this rod, let me come and bring it again. Because you see, everything God does begins with what he says. You see, we are used to trying to, uh, how do I put it? We try to repeat what God did by ourselves, not by God. So that's why you didn't find Moses going to repeat all those miracles. Because only once God spoke it and it was done. And if God will need to do it again, he will still need to hear God for him to do it. If God has not said it, don't try to, to do anything. Just follow God. Are you following me? Alright. So, Jacob asked the man, what's your name? He didn't introduce his name because it's not necessary. There's no need for you to know my name. I've done what I need to do. What will he do for you if you know the name of an angel? Except to make you proud. Ha! One angel came. His name is Jakaluchu Jakaluchu. I saw him. Have you read in the Bible how many times the names of angels are mentioned? But their works are mentioned. For example, when he says goodness and mercy, those are, are, are angels that accompany where the grace of God is. But you don't know their names. They are only called goodness and mercy. They follow you on your journey. So that journey becomes goodness. You know, somebody prayed one prayer a long time ago. I said, which kind of prayer is that? He said, goodness and mercy will follow you. I didn't say amen. I said amen, but in my heart I was saying, no, I don't understand what he said. It was later I got to understand. That is good prayer, which means those angels will follow you on this your journey. So if somebody says goodness and mercy will go with you, understand. We are not just quoting Psalm 23. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you can see glimpses of those things everywhere in the scripture. Do you know the names of the angels that sank the walls of Jericho? Their names were not mentioned. The only thing close to that that um, you know, uh, uh, Joshua saw before that happened 
was that he saw the captain of the host. He said, I'm the, I am the captain of the host. That's all. And then he asked a question, are you for us or you are for our enemy? And he said, I'm neither for you nor for your enemy. I'm on the side of God. If you're on the side of God, we're here to battle together. <laughs> because angels are not necessarily for you. They are for God. So if you are on God's side, they will work with you. That's why every time you walk against God, they hold their peace and watch you. You also know that angels don't understand many things. That's why Paul will write that we will teach angels. We will minister to them. We are the ones that we explain to them. How do we explain to them? The way we walk. Angels, for example, don't under, they don't understand redemption. They don't know salvation. What? <laughs> because they have never been redeemed. Never. The angels that sinned or disobeyed, did God forgive them? Will God ever forgive them? There's no redemption for angels. Because they know and they don't understand. That's why the Bible says they themselves, they, they wonder, they are still searching. Gabriel does not understand what redemption means. He can come and deliver the word. That's why angels don't preach. Because they don't have understanding. They don't have revelation in that aspect. Except God tells them. So they come to deliver the word of God. That's why when Peter was sent forth, um, Cornelius, you know, sent for Peter. He, actually, the angel that appeared to him said, he should send to Joppa and inquire in the house of Simon the Tanner. There he will find Simon Peter. He should call Simon Peter to come tell him the word of, or what, word of God or the word of, or word of God, whereby he and his household will be saved. So why didn't the angel just preach? I say, Cornelius, you need to be born again. He doesn't know it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Praise the Lord. But you know the good thing? Angels are your fellow servants. They are your servants. They are to serve you. That's what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 13. Alright? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 13 or 14. Are they not all ministry spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation. They don't minister to, they minister for. Because they are sent by God. It is not your bidding that they do. They do the bidding of heaven. So if you are speaking and your bidding agrees with what God has said, they will do it. He said, bless ye his angel that excel in strength, that hearken to the voice. Not the word, the voice of God. They hearken to what? The voice of God. What is the voice of God? The word. When you speak the word of God, they hearken. When you speak something contrary, they don't know what you are saying. The only thing they obey is the word of God. Okay, let's leave angels today. Let's move on. Let's read on. And Jacob asked him and said, tell me I pray thee. Okay, we have read this and he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God face to face and my life is what? Preserved. Hallelujah. And as he passed on Penel, the sun rose upon him and he halted upon his thigh. All right? Therefore, the children of Israel ate not the sinew, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh. Now, this is their own law. They just decided that they won't be eating anything that has to do, you know, with the hip bone. Now, but let's go to the next chapter, please. All right, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came with him, 400 men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. Hmm. This man never changed. Even after the Lord touched him, his mind is not renewed yet. Next verse, please. <laughs> and he put the maid and their children foremost. And Leah and her children after. Rachel and Joseph hindermost. You know what he did? So that in case, when Esau start killing, before he gets to Joseph and Rachel, my beloved wife, my lover, hey, they will have escaped. Even when God had touched him, the man, the Jacob in him. (laughs) 
All right, let's read on. <laughs> and he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times. Kai. Because he wasn't too sure what Esau will do. Until he came near to his brother Esau. All right? And Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Praise the Lord. Now let's look at, let's go back again from where we started. The Bible says Jacob was left alone and then there wrestled a man with him. Now if you read, if we had read earlier, he was just returning from Laban's house. God had blessed him with material, financial material blessing. He had all of Laban's wealth, not some, all. Because by the time he was living, even his own children said, Kai, Kai, Jacob has taken all. All of our father's possession. And was he the one that took it? No, God only transferred it to him. I believe we're in a season where we're going to see this kind of supernatural thing. But I am going to tell you that the key to it is service. God cannot transfer to you when you have not been part of building it. You will not know how to handle it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So if you are not part of building, God cannot handle to you. You have to be faithful, helping to build. So when God is looking for who I can transfer to, then God will look for you and will give it to you because he knows you have been there. Do you understand me? Praise the Lord. Because when you read about Jacob, you'll find out that Jacob was in, in Laban's house for 20 years to 21 years. What was in, in, you know, the 21st year that he left. What was he doing? 10 times. 10 times. Laban. Yes. All right. Change his wages. He will tell you, we'll pay you when he came the first time. He say, you are ready to serve? He say, yes. It's okay, I'm going to pay you, let's assume, $20,000. It's okay, fine. It's a good place to start. Then when it was time to pay, he said, no, 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 no. I've just changed it. Now I'm going to pay you $15,000. It's okay, no problem. He never paid him. Go and check. All those years, Jake, I mean, Leba never paid him a single thing. He kept changing it. Kept changing it. Kept changing it. So who was sustaining him? But the man for the first time in the life, the Jacob I knew before he came there, Kai, he will deal with the man. He will look for an opportunity. Jacob is somebody that capitalizes on your weakness. That's why when Esau came back, and Esau came back hungry one day, he had been waiting. I'm going to deal with this, my elder brother. He thinks he's the one. Everything, when we come to talk, and say, I'm the elder brother. Keep quiet. Okay. So he must have been thinking, how do I? That day he cooked some things. And then he came back. Now listen to me. The problem, with that's why the Bible says we must not be like Esau. Esau is a man who could not tame his, his appetite. And this appetite is not just, some people's appetite is sex. You can't tame it. You must know when to, listen to me, if you can't tame, if any appetite you can't tame will kill you. Some people is fashion. You can't say no to fashion. When it comes, ha ha, they say we are doing a, what do you call it? Ashwebi. You buy. Listen to me. Some people will not eat. They won't eat well. Ashwebi. They can buy gold on credit. They won't give up. But they keep collecting on credit. How do you live your life like that? Am I not looking fine today? Mm. This morning we were coming, my wife was looking at me. I was smiling. She said, you are a fine boy. <laughs> Put my hand up. <laughs> but in this just, there was a time, all we had, two trousers, three shirts. So in the night, we wash it, hang it on the fan. Thank God. Fan. The fan, we, we dry it, we wait. But you didn't know. All right? So tell people, give me clothes. I don't buy. My wife tells me, say, so what do we do with this thing? I say, the one we give, we give. We pass it on. As we are passing it on, new ones are coming. So I keep, I say, Lord, so what do I do? Should I stop giving? 
Because I don't want this clothes. This one I wore it because I came to Joss. I can't remember. I, there are many programs I go for. I just dress like pastor. It's easier so that you don't sweat. Because suit does not like you sweating in it. How can you be sweating and, and, and people say, yes, that's the regalia for ministration. It's not the regalia. I know you people have it here. That's why I dress like this. But I noticed that even this place too is hot. Today. Amen. Tomorrow it won't be hot. We believe it will get cooler. Which means we, we need to add more ACs here. And the people who should do it are here. Pastor does not need to say it. If it's that hot for you, five of you can come together and say, how much is AC? Standing AC, we can put it here. Or want to change this AC. There's nothing wrong with five people coming together. Put the money together and say, Pastor, we have decided that we want to change the ACs. This place is getting hot. We want to change it. God will bless you. He doesn't even have to say it. So if I want you have, they have not called for AC. And you are getting hot. The place is uncomfortable for you. You want the place to be more comfortable. Uh -uh. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, so listen to me. Some, some of us, our appetite is not, is not just food. Like I said, some is sex. You can't say no to sex. And if you can't say no, the devil will use it to hold you down. Anything you can't say no to, it will hold you down. Praise the Lord. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Gloria Mokunga wrote a book a long time ago called Your No Can Be Anointed. It's true. So if it's time to say no, say no and stick with your no. So people who are not giving fashion, people are giving to fashion. You will see that when they make up, eh, when they come, you will think they have given. When it's time for offering, what they are giving. Not commensurate with what they are wearing. It's not a life to live. We are spiritual people. Your investment should be more in spiritual things. See, listen to me. I can tell where you are going if I know what you give your most time to. And your resources. If what takes more of your time is phone. I used to have a friend who is a phone freak. Any new phone that comes out, he buys. And if you are that way, Samsung will deal with you. Because Samsung, as, they are, as you are buying, you are leaving, another one is coming out. So, which means you just use it and go back. When I heard that the phone that Dan Gote uses, not any serious phone. I think it's Nokia or something. Huh? Some I don't know exactly, but I you know using serious phone like you people do. That's a man who can afford to buy the whole of Samsung. Well, maybe not the whole of Samsung. But buy whatsoever they have in mind to do between now and ten years. But yet he's using common phone. Is it not to make call? It is those who don't have the money, they are the ones going for big, big phone know what I have. It's a mindset. I heard, I was told reliably by somebody that Bill Gates did not give his children, they didn't start using mobile phone until they were 13 or so. 16. Or 16. Something like that. I think either 13 or 16. Can you imagine? The one, one time the most richest man in the world, the man called Microsoft. You will think, uh -uh, his children should just have gadgets everywhere. My friends, they themselves know that those things destroy children. It is you. Who does not have small? You don't even have peanut. You are the ones. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah. They say, you are buying things. No, my friends, we need to learn. We need to learn. I learned from a rich man a long time ago. He's gone home to be with the Lord now. He said to us, he said, don't chase money. I thought he would say, chase money. The man said, don't chase money. Companies were closing down in the in UK he was buying. So this man said, he doesn't chase money. Then he told us something. He said, do you know what? He has a principle. That God is the one who gives money or wealth. Praise the Lord. And then he said, in his factory, he will tell these people, I'm not telling you not to steal. 
the only thing is don't steal to the detriment of the factory. Because we need the factory to continue to run so that your children can be employed. I said that's the mindset of Jesus. Why will Jesus go and keep the treasury, the account with Judas who is a thief? Are you understanding what I'm saying? There? We learn from everything. So don't, 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 don't chase after things. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, all these things shall be yours. They will be added to you. It's an addition to you. It's not the main thing. So when you have them, it's God just adding to your life to make your life more comfortable for you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some people... Is cars. Cars. They just like cars. They can't say no. When a new car comes out, ah, we must get it. And if you live your life like that, you won't make progress in God. Praise the Lord. Now, so Jacob was left alone, and then the Bible says this man wrestled with him. We understand that the man that wrestled him with him was an angel. Now, the Bible says the angel wrestled with him until the break of day. If I understand, let me show you something quickly. Because the Bible says the angel wrestled with him until what? The break of, break of day. Which means the angel's intention and the reason why God sent him is that, see, make sure your wrestling expires by the break of day. If day breaks and you have not succeeded, leave the man alone. Time is fixed. Are you getting what I'm saying? So this angel came, saw the man resting. Only him. He sent his, you know, his wife, his children ahead. And then he was waiting their rest. And then the Bible says this angel started wrestling with, with him until the break of day. Why was he wrestling with him? Because listen to me, Jacob, even though Jacob had financial and material blessing, but yet the purpose of God had not been done. Now, did you notice he said, he wrestled with him until what? The break of day. Now, this scripture also tells me that if the angel said, if the Bible says the angel wrestled with him until the break of day, or the man wrestled with him until the break of day, it simply means that Jacob was actually in the dark or in the night. That's what it signifies. Now, let's read on because I want to show you something. And then I go to Genesis chapter 20, 28. I want to show you something. And when he saw that, the, that he prevailed not against him, he did what? He touched the all of his thigh. Why did he touch the all of his thigh? Because that was one of the major issues. The man was strong in himself. So God had to disjoint that place of strength so that he can, for the first time, let go. Are you following me? So he touched the whole of his thigh. And the whole of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. But the man didn't let go. He was still holding. Jacob was still holding to that angel. Next verse. And then I'll show you something in Genesis 28. He says, and he said, let me go for the day break it. The day is about to break. Let me go. Now, let's go back to verse 24 because I said something there that he was left alone. And the Bible says they are wrestled with him a man until the breaking of the day. And I said, what that meant is that he was in the night. Right? If he's talking about daybreak, daybreak simply means in, mean, uh, sunrise or whatsoever you want to call it. The break of day. Okay, now, which means he must be in the dark, he must be in the night. Now, I want to show you something quickly so that we can compare. Genesis chapter 28. Give me Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28, I think it is. I read it by passing yesterday. Genesis 28. Give me verse uh, 10. Let me begin from verse 10 if you were there. Genesis 28, verse 10. Look at it with me. And Jacob was, I mean, sorry. And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went um, toward Haran. Next verse. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun, the sun was set. What is sunset? Darkness has come. 
Now, I want you to understand this because I'll read further so that you can understand what I'm saying. I'll come back here. Because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put for um, uh, uh, sorry and put them for his pillows and you know laid down in the place to sleep. And then he had this revelation or this vision, that's dream. And he dreamt, and behold, a ladder set upon or set up on the on the earth, and the top of it reached to the heaven. And behold, angels of God ascending and descending. Next verse, I'm just reading on. Maybe I'll read till the end. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. Did you know that God omitted his name? I am the God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. But he didn't say, I'm also your God. Why? Because at this time, Jacob didn't know God. He was just living his life. But God says, I am the God of your grandfather, Abraham. I am the God of your father, Abraham. I am the God of your father, Isaac. God should have just said, I'm also your God. Now listen to what God said. And hear what he said. I am, the, I, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land where, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. Next verse. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth. And thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee shall all, uh, uh, sorry, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's God's agenda for us. That through you, through us, our nations will be blessed. Okay, and behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again unto this land for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken, um, you know, to thee of. And Jacob awake, or awoke, all right, awake out of his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I know it not. Next verse, please. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Next verse. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon, upon the top of it. Next verse. And he called the name of the place. Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of the city was called what? Luz, at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me. I thought God had already said that. Amen? God said that earlier. I will be with you. I will take you on this journey. I will bring you back and I will fulfill the promise that I made to you. I will give this land to you. Now see what the man is praying. People don't hear God well. So they are in a hurry to ask, Pastor, pray. God just spoke to you. But you are still saying, pray. So here. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, Lord, or uh, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. If God is with you, is it bread and raiment that will be issued? God said he will take you and bring you back. Alright? I think we read it earlier. I will look for that version or that verse. Please, I, I will need to, to get, get something there later. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, Lord, if you, if you do this, you know, uh, uh, you know, and give me bread to eat and raiment to, to put on. Is he praying like a carnal man? Yes. Bread to eat. Clothes to wear. He's a carnal man at this point. Next verse. So that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my word. Which means if you will do this. I am ready. When I come back. You will be my God. But as I'm going now. I'm not sure. Do these things first. Next verse. So. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And. Of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give thee tent unto thee. Which means I will pay tight. After you have done these things. Not before. Are there Christians like that today? Next verse. Is that the last verse? 
Okay. Now, take note that he said to God, I think it's verse 13. Give me verse 13. You know, I am with thee, and will keep thee, okay, in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee. Has God already said that? But what was his prayer? God, if you take me and bring me back, and you give me food to eat, remain to wear, then you will be my God. I will pay tight. I will make this place. I will pour oil here. Is, he, is that a man that understood God? That no wonder God didn't say he was his God. God said, I'm the God of your father, Abraham, the God of your father, Isaac. Because the man he was talking to, even God himself knew that this man, he has not changed, he, has not, he doesn't know me. Now, but well, this is what I want you to see. In verse 10, the Bible says, because the sun was set. Now, I want you to understand this. The scripture we read in Genesis chapter 32 and... Um, Verse 24, he said, and a man, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the break of day. This is what I want you to see. My understanding about Jacob is that his life, his life set here. The night caught up with him in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10. Until Genesis chapter 32, he experienced, he woke up in the morning. What you see, you need to understand what God is saying. Which means, Jacob, all his life, even when he was in Laban's house, was in his night. So here was an opportunity for God to open his day to him. And that was going to happen, and that's what we read in Genesis chapter 20, 32, verse 24. So he was left alone, so the angel came to wrestle with him. Why? Because he had all this while been in the night. You can be in the night and yet be receiving financial reward. Because if you are faithful, it is a law that you will attract God's blessing. If you are faithful, for the first time Jacob was faithful, serving his master, his uncle, his master, both of them, both master, but the man treated him not like, you know, uh, he didn't treat him like his uncle, he was treating him like his master. He served him faithfully. That's why God could transfer that wealth to him. Because God showed him, an angel came and appeared to him in a dream and showed him how he could transfer that wealth. Or that wealth would be transferred to him. And that's why he had understand it. And the wealth was transferred to him. Are you understanding me? But even then, Jacob was still in his night. That is why, as we read here, the angel said to him, let me go. You will find it later. The Bible says in this, because he was left alone, the angel wrestled with him until the break of day. But as they journey, as they wrestle, next verse, please. As they wrestle, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the man is still in the night, and he doesn't know that what needs to be done needs to be done before daybreak, because daybreak is the opening of a new era in the life of Jacob. In fact, Jacob, Israel was going to begin. Jacob has always been the one running things. But God wanted Israel. It's only Israel that God will bring. Bless with his covenant blessing. Not Jacob. And so this day came. And as they wrestled, the Bible says the angel discovered he wasn't prevailing. So he said, no, we need to do damage to these things. So he touched the whole of his thigh. And then the Bible says the whole of his thigh was out of joint. Which means from that day, when you read further, you find out that Jacob started walking with a stick. With a walking stick because he was limping. And yet, why wouldn't God not heal him? The man died limping. Because you need to understand that there are some things that God will do in your life that will remain with you to show God's handwriting on your own life. I will have taught the God we know who is the healer should have healed him. Don't you think so? But did you remember that when he was going to bless the children of Joseph, the Bible says, and he leaned on his walking stick bless them. Which means all his life, from that moment, the man kept limping. And yet God wouldn't heal him. Do you understand that dimension of God? There are many sides of God that we need to know. <laughs> so that even without it, because God knew if that was not done, the man will fulfill purpose and destiny. Israel will not come. Okay, so, next verse please, verse 20. And he said, because he couldn't prevail, let me go for the day is about to break. What was he saying? Is he talking about natural daybreak? No. He was saying, listen to me, what needs to happen must happen before daybreak. Because daybreak is your, 
is the fulfillment of the will of God in your life. So as they battled and went further, the Bible says, and he said, I will not let thee go on unless you bless me. What blessing was he asking for? Which means at this point, Jacob recognized that I have not connected with the blessing, the covenant of Abraham and Isaac. And I need that covenant. I need to connect with it. Yes, I have material things. So you understand, I wasn't asking for material things anymore. You already had that. He wasn't saying, oh, that you will increase my wealth. No, that's not what he was asking for. You already had that. He had so much that even he himself was so blessed. The Bible says in his own words, he said, when I crossed, when I crossed this, this, you know, this fog, you know, he only had a staff, shepherd staff. And then, what did he have? The best way I can explain it to you is that he had a leather bag. A man who is running away from his brother, from death. Do you have time to pack? If somebody is out to kill you, and you are running, you will have time to pack. No, sir. You will carry quickly. You just carry it to pack, and you are running away. So he was running with leather bag quickly. But when he came by, he said, God has expounded me two bounds. What is two bounds? The whole of the cattle that Laban had became his. If Laban also had gold and silver, they became his. That was a man who was running away when he was, he was sleeping on that bridge. But now he's owning, in, he's own, owning Lagos or owning Joss. How did that come about? When God blesses you, it doesn't matter where you come from. As long as the evidence of God is with you and you are working with him, God can transform your life. That's why you must stay with God and keep working with him. Working with God pays. It doesn't cost you. It may not be there now. And you know, I have a popular saying that you know that I regularly say that God may not pay you every day. But when God is ready to pay you, he pays you in arrears. As long as you are faithful and you keep working with God, walk with God. Don't walk with men. Walk with men, but walk for God. If you are working with people, make sure you walk with the mentality that you are working for God. That's what the Bible says. So if I am in, in this church and you are in any functional department, it doesn't mean, oh, we are just here to help Pastor Dunka. No, this is your church. God sent you here. You are doing your part. And God is the one who will reward. God does not reward emptiness. You know, I tell them in my church, I say, even if I promote you, even if I make you something, I ordain you a pastor. Maybe, you know, because some people think pastor is a great honor in a local church. So even if I anoint you, ordain you a pastor, if God has not ordained you, I've just wasted my time. If I borrowed Korodon of oil on you, just know that it's wasted. I will have bought that. I will have used that money to do something else. It's even better to go and give people in terminus who are begging for money. You will pay me better. So what does that mean? It simply means... That when you are serving, you are not serving man. You are serving God. Paul was writing to servants. He said, make sure you serve your masters as unto the Lord. That's talking about employed, people who are employed. If you are working, you know, in the government, serve the place as unto the Lord. Don't do like other, everybody is doing. So you wake up by 8. Work that you are supposed to be you resume by 8. You are waking up by 8. Then you take time to... To stroll around, you listen to morning news, you listen to, then you say, I'm still going to the office, I'll be there. Ah, you know, nothing happened in our office. Ah, it's government, it's government work. You know, government work, you don't need things to be there. You know what you are telling God? God, don't bring me into my own. You have to change the place. Have you had people say to other people, uh uh. You came early yesterday. You came early. Is this your father's work? Yes, it is. Government work is my father's work. I'm representing him here. So you must carry that mentality. And then you go to your work and then you are there. At the time you ought to leave. And don't leave before time. If you need to leave, take permission. They say, where are you? You say, ah, that's even 
even to go to church. The Bible says there's time for everything. All right? If it's time to be at work and you are in church, even God will honor you. And when it's time to be in church, you are at work. God will not bless you. There's time for everything. You must know the time and be there. It's the agreement you had with them. So if you are supposed to be there 8 to 4, be there 8 to 4. Do everything you need to do. You say there's no work. Carry your Bible and read. Read this a little because there's no work. You don't have work. Be hearing the word of God. Or look for something to do. Create something. Oh, there's no work today. I think this place is dirty. I can sweep it. Let me sweep it a little. You say it's not part of it. God is preparing you for your own. That's the way God does. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Praise the Lord. I don't believe Christians should go out, uh, you know, except what you are, you are led. If you are led, no problem. But it doesn't mean because they have not paid you two, three, four months. You say, ah, pastor, I think I will leave this job. Is that what God is saying? You need to hear God. You can leave that job and that's the end of, the, of, 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 of employment for your life. Oh. You just be looking, running from one pillar to post. No, stay there. A lady came to me, was working with Cool FM. She said, pastor, uh, the way they are treating me, I said, no, the Lord has not said you should leave. Stay there, stay there. He said, pastor, you don't understand. I said, I understand. Stay there. I don't need to understand it necessarily. Don't stay there. When it is time, God will move you. You will know. Praise God. Now, you need to know that and you need to understand that so that you can stay in the will of God. The will of God is the best. The will of God is the best in everything. The will of God is the best. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Do you know what? Should I share some things? Praise the Lord. For those who are not married, you will gain. For those who are married, you will also gain. But listen to me. There's nobody that says that when you get married today, you should give birth tomorrow. Nobody. So plan how your children will come. That also shows you are thinking like your father God. Everything God did, he planned it. Everything, including taking the children of Israel to Babylon. I know the thoughts, the plan I have for you. You say, God, going to Babylon. Yes, sir. This is plan. He took them there. But you see, these days, people just get... That's why before you marry, you should know everything that you need to study about period. Uh, what do you call it? Menstrual men, circle. Uh, you know, uh, when, when your, your wife, uh, ovulation time and things like that. Go and study it. It's part of what you should do. If not, we will in fact, you should inculcate it into our marriage counseling, sir. That do you know, ask them questions. If they don't know, oh yeah, oh yeah. Go and look. when you come back for the next wife, no, you won't marry you. You know why? We will help some of our young men. Because some of them are not prepared. Even the women are not prepared. You know what childbearing is? If it comes, it disorganizes everything. Because that child becomes the priority. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no reason why you should marry. The first thing you want to do, I want to, you to understand this. That when you marry, know your wife. Wife, know your husband. First, don't allow the third person. If that child comes in, you people don't understand. You, you will quarrel a lot. Many troubles will just come. <laughs> and before you know, either the man, it depends on who spends more time with the child. The woman will feel, if it's the woman, the man will feel, since this shy came now, you don't have time for me again. Trouble don't come. Home. Or the wife is saying, the way when you just come, you don't even have time for me. You are is this baby, you just come back from work. Hey, 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 hey. That's already teaching problem. You don't need to go through that. So you plan. Do you understand what I'm saying? understand each other. I also encourage people when you marry, don't bring, don't be, don't go and bring uncle to come and live with you. Eh, eh. Don't even bring friends. If friends say they want to say, I beg, I want to know my wife. Because we need to understand each other. We are coming from different backgrounds. Even if you, you people are in the same church, you don't know each other all, until you start living. That's when everybody will start, okay, we don't marry. Thank you, sir. You'll start unpacking. 
And that unpacking will cause serious trouble many times. It doesn't never stop, but at least I feel the first few years is good to understand each other. It will help to, to unite your hearts together. You plan your family. It's good. It helps you. Praise the Lord. Some of these things we were not taught. The only thing that helped us is that we didn't give birth early. So it helped us to know my wife. We knew ourselves. Am I communicating? For 13 years. It was good. So we knew each other. We were together. And all our lives we have lived together. We have been alone, living. Yeah, once in a while people came to live with us. But it didn't break that what we know. Are you understanding me? Because it will help you in your marriage. Praise the Lord. And then when you now plan your children, you know when they should come. Because listen to me. If you are not ready for children, when they start coming, they will stress you. Number two, that's emotionally, financially. When they start going to school, <laughs> may God help you that you don't have a child that is only comfortable in AC. So when Nepa go, you no get generator. You know you have to stay awake and be fanning them. <laughs> and you are going to work the next day. These are realities. So you take your time to plan. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you did that before now, don't worry. We thank God. The mercy of God is covering us. But from now forward, you need to plan. Praise the Lord. Discuss how many children do you want to have? I asked a man, he said, as many as the Lord will give us. I said, okay. Just make sure you have the money. Because these days, the public schools is not helping. Now it has even got, even to send your children now to, to public university is trouble in Nigeria. Prof was telling me that, uh, okay, I don't know if those information should be said, but it looks like the government is still owing them and there's a tendency that they may go on strike again. Private university, you will have the do or you send them abroad. And to go abroad will cost you more. Praise the Lord. Because listen to me, your children will not understand why their mates are in school. You say you don't have money to sponsor. Those days are past. So you need to prepare. If it is one, you can have part time. Have one first. Alright? And build your wealth. Then after two, three, four, five, six years, you can have the second. There's nobody that say heaven will fall. If you space them. After all, if you even space them, you'll find out that by the time the first one is graduating from the university and gets or starts working, he'll be training the second one for you. <laughs> Wisdom is profitable to direct. Hallelujah. <laughs> But understand your wife. That's what I want to say. Don't, don't allow a third party, party into your home immediately. They disorganize things. You know why? Because if you have third party, every time you people quarrel, the man will know. And you are in one room. And there's the third person. So how are you people sleeping? You say, well, we just try. Will you people be sleeping together? Except when the person is not around. No. There are certain things we shouldn't do. I didn't marry you with your entire family. You understand in the sense? No, I married you. So let us grow first. If we can accommodate people, we will take people. If we can't, let them stay away. You know, I said to you the other day that God told me not to play God in the lives of people. You can't help everybody, sir. You may have a heart to help people, but if, if you don't get the money, how do you help? Don't break yourself. Eh? It must, thank you. It must be heart plus hand. If it's not there, you say, I really want to keep praying. And say, God, you know my heart. You know my heart. I trust you. When it comes, 
I'll do it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are not sent to, to you are not Abraham. That is father of many nations. So if Abraham married all the women in the world, they will still be pregnant for him. Because even after Sarah and Hagar, Keturah came. He continued. And when you study, Abraham was over 120 years old. He was still giving birth with the sons of the sons of Keturah. You say, what happened? It's the word of God that is working. <laughs> Father of many nations. It means you have children everywhere. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's not what God called you to do. So do your own. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And listen to me, if you have purpose to fulfill, you won't be thinking of many children. <laughs> because the time it takes to train a child to when that child can finally be released and say you have done a good job, my friends, it's not easy. It's not easy. To train a child, and you know what? If you don't train them well, God will judge you. Because you are there. They are custodian. God put them in your hand. So if you don't... Do you understand? God knew you could take care of them. But your foolishness is what is not allowing. Your ignorance may, not, may also be it. Your lack of planning may also be it. God will never come to you and say, why have you not have children? Why? By now you should have children. God, I have not, I don't, God will never say that. Maybe he will, probably. I don't know, but he has never. Uh, uh, you know, God understands that. See, you also need to build. That's why God does not need to tell you about planning. He has given you what we call common sense. Through it, you plan. For many of us who came to church this morning, some of us started planning yesterday. We ironed our clothes. Because we are coming to service this morning. Pastor told us, bring your calm gas. Bring your food. Some of us did. So after a while, you go and eat your lunch small. Come back and sit. It's part of planning. The Holy Ghost will not get angry and run away because you are eating. Because I read in my Bible in Acts chapter 10 that while Peter was getting ready, food was being getting was 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 being cooked and made ready. The Bible says the man was just pacing. He wasn't praying in the Holy Ghost. He was just waiting for food. He just said, Kai, this food, I'm really hungry. And while he was waiting for food, the Bible says, and he fell into a trance. Ah, you are thinking about food and you are falling into a trance. That's to tell you that the Holy Spirit can work anytime. Food or no food. So people believe that if I don't fast, that's what I used to think. If I don't fast, the Lord will not move. The Lord had to correct my mind that, Mr. Man, it's not about fasting. So one day God told me, he said, Joseph, the way you are going, you will make yourself think it's your fasting that makes me walk. No. It's not because of your fast. Just live your life. If you need to fast, you will know. Fast. Alright? If you need to eat, eat. So there are times I eat and I still prophesy. And there are times I don't eat and I still prophesy. So it's not about eating. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's one of my pastors that is very close. My wife keeps saying, ah, the way this guy is fasting. I say, don't worry. He will learn soon. So when you don't have program, you if you don't have program for one year, it means you will eat too. Then when you have program, you go to fast. No, that's not. We should live our lives and just, you know, allow God. Your fasting is not what God makes. It's what makes God move. What fasting does to you is to change you. But you don't need change if you are already changed and you are positioned rightly. What is your fasting going to do after you have been positioned? You just keep walking in that realm. You think John the Beloved was fasting the day he caught a revelation and he went to heaven and started writing uh, uh, the, you know, the book of Revelation? I don't think. The man was in exile. Waiting for the day he will be released. In case they will be released or not. They did everything to him. Threw him into um, you know, oil. And the man didn't die. Because he, has to, he was the one commissioned by God to write Revelation. So until he had, he had written it, he didn't die. Am I communicating? But I don't think the man was necessarily fasting and saying, oh God, revel he didn't even know revelation was coming. Sorry, sir. Okay. <laughs> it was divinely granted. It was just given by God. 
These things, it's not like every time you just plan, oh yeah, I need to fast. If I fast, I'll be good. No, I read that Jesus was hungry and he was actually looking for food to eat. He saw a tree. And then he discovered there was no fruit on it and then he cursed it. But Jesus was as he was hungry and he wanted to eat. Those are the things that bless me when I read scripture. That even Jesus himself was hungry and he was looking for food to eat. I thought Jesus shouldn't be hungry. All he came to do is the will of God. Eating food is also the will of God. After this meeting, I will eat. And it's the will of God. If you don't eat, you will die. You will not be able to, this body will not sustain you to do, the, to do ministry. So you need to eat. Didn't you notice that even when Jesus finished fasting, he was looking for food to eat? It was because the devil spoke. He was going into the, he was going into the city to eat food. Because he didn't carry food to the wilderness. Don't, don't fast like uh, Muslims do. When we say we announce, you know, Christians these days, when we announce one week of fast, generally mostly churches fast. They say one week. Some people say 21 days. Hi, 14 days. Some people, they say, oh, pastor, don't come again now. Then the first day, did you notice that? You know how people fast? They start gathering the food from money. So they just started fasting. You know? They see puff puff. They call puff puff. <laughs> they see apple. They buy. So are you really fasting? <laughs> oh, Kai. Kai, Kai, Kai. If God was using that to judge us, I'm sure many of us won't stand though. You are already thinking about evening and you are gathering it in the morning. Your heart is where? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God for his mercy. <laughs> so you know it's not because of your fast. The fast is to position you. Alright? Praise the Lord. Okay? So Jacob fought with this man and he said, let me go. And he said, I won't let you go except thou bless me. And I said the blessing he was referring to was to connect with the, his destiny. He knew, yeah, his father blessed him, Genesis 27, but the blessing that his father gave to him did not rest on him. If he rested, there were certain things that happened in the house of Laban that shouldn't happen. He had to serve 14 years to marry the real wife he really wanted to marry. Is that a blessing or a curse? You were swindled too. Because that's what you planted and you didn't destroy. That's why you must be mindful of what you are doing to somebody else. Because that may either be done to you or to your own children. Am I communicating? You are not, have an opportunity to do good and you are not doing good. What you are simply saying is somebody will do evil to you too. Except you repent or you, you know, God has, you know, have mercy on you. Are you still with me? Now look at what I want to show you and then we'll conclude my teaching and then I, I trust God to begin to minister. Now when Jacob said, except thou bless me, see what the angel said next. He said to him, what is your name? And he said unto him, what is thy name? Which means, what is your name? Now, he wasn't asking as though he didn't know Jacob's name. After all, before God sent him, he will have known I'm sending you to Jacob. Not to everybody. So he knew his name. But why was he asking, what is your name? He wasn't asking, what is your name as per? Please, can I know your name, please? No. He was asking, what is it about the issues in your life? What is wrong with you? What do you think is wrong with you? And he mentioned what was wrong with him. What was wrong with him? Jacob. That was what was wrong with him. He was able to identify what was wrong with him. Praise the Lord. Now, at this point, God was going to reset the life of Jacob to the original order of God. Because the reason why God spoke about Jacob, Jacob I love, is so I hate, is not because his name should be Jacob and then he'll begin to swindle people. No. It is because God is working with Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob or Israel. That was God's intention. That's the reason why he came. But he missed his part, even though he had financial blessing, but yet he wasn't in the will of God. So God had to reset the order of things and brought him back to the original place. That's why the angel asked him, what is your name or what's wrong with you? What is your name? And he said, my name is Jacob. Now, have you noticed this? That many times or often when you go to see a doctor, a doctor prescribes um, drugs for you based on what you tell him. Have you noticed? So? so you get to a doctor, you know, and then the doctor says, so what's wrong with you? You say, well, I, I couldn't sleep well. Uh, interval, I just kept waking up and vomiting and doing this. Okay, well, ask you another question. While he's asking you, you see him, he's writing. Which means, your help is actually in your own mouth. The angel came to help, but you need to say it before I can help you. God operates like that. Blind Bartimaeus eventually was called by Jesus. Didn't Jesus see that the man was blind? Was Jesus blind? Jesus was not blind. He saw a blind man. In fact, they led him to Jesus because he was blind. He didn't know where Jesus was. So they led him. He came. And Jesus said, yes, young man, what do you want me to do for you? Uh -uh. If you were the one, would you ask you? excuse me, sir. I am the one that is blind here. Are you also blind, sir? Can't you see that I'm blind? Listen to me. He may not have come for that reason. He may have come for something else. You can't assume for him. I was ministering on the healing line, laying hands on people, and God was doing miracles in the life of people. And then there was this girl who came limping. One leg was shorter than the other. And two people before her, I said to myself, oh God, thank you because today we're going to see a miracle of, of or, you know, a creative miracle that, you know, this leg will grow. The other leg will grow. And when it was her turn, I laid hands on her to pray for a creative miracle. I wanted that leg to grow. All right? The Holy Spirit said, ask her what she came for. I said, ah, Lord, it is clear. You know, sometimes you know better than the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Lord, it's clear. Can you not see it? The Holy Spirit said to me, gently again, ask her what she came for. He's like, don't go ahead of yourself. Ask her what she came for. So I said, okay, Lord, you'll be surprised. I will ask her and she will tell you. <laughs> and you know the Holy Ghost is not offended. So I asked her, I said, so what did you come for? He said, oh yeah, Pastor. Uh, I have this stomach pain, you know. Yeah. Do you know, me who wanted to pray was disappointed. <laughs> we just saw God Heal paralysis. Somebody who you know who had not been able to walk on his legs. So God just healed the person. Ah, and you are seeing miracle happen there. Somebody had deaf, you know, uh, one ear had been deaf for I think eight years or so. And the person, eight years more. Uh, and the person saw, suddenly said the that ear had just opened. And we are seeing miracle. I would have thought. So in my mind, I said, No. If God is moving this way, God must do creative miracle. No, you are not the one to enforce miracle on people. You are not the one to believe for somebody. So you need to ask the people. So I asked. And the lady said, I have stomachache. I was disappointed. And the Lord now said, you see the reason why I said you should ask. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Oh. We always miss it without the Holy Spirit. There was something I wrote yesterday that I said. That prophetic help cannot come without the helper. I didn't say it yesterday, but I remember that. So I can say it. Prophetic help. Or helping hands cannot come without the helper himself. So a prophet must depend on the helper to bring help to people or relief to people. For a prophet to bless you, he has to depend on the blesser, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. If he does not respond to the comforter, he can't bless you. He will just be on his own, just saying what he wants to say. Are you with me? Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. All right, so. 
he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. Now, watch what he said after then. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but what? Israel. For as a prince has thou power with God and with men and has what? Prevailed. From that day, his entire life changed. God changed his destiny and purpose. His destiny was defined. Before now, he didn't know he was Israel. That he, had his, he was pregnant of Israel, but Israel was not, def, was not, was not coming for all things. God induced Israel. So some of you will live here. You didn't know the things that are embedded in you suddenly will begin to show up after today. Are you getting what I'm saying? So God will reset seasons for you. He will induce seasons for you, but he will also release. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He will release seasons for you. Praise the Lord. And we said to release means to launch. Which means God is launching you into a new path. Now, let's conclude with I, uh, J Jacob and then uh, you know, I begin to minister. Now, listen. After then, did you notice that Jacob left from there? Israel. Jacob, Israel now. Left from there. And in chapter 33 where we read, verse 4, or verse 3. I mean verse 1. The Bible says when he came from there. After his name has been changed. His destiny has been changed. Destiny defining moment. When after God had released him. Into Israel. Because that's what happened. It was induced but he was also released. So you find the three happening to Jacob at the same time. He was. God reset him. Or ex experienced reset. And then experience induced. God induced Israel and then also released Israel to fulfill God's purpose. Now, and then from that moment, acceleration started. I was, that's what I want to show you. So in chapter 1 of that place, he sighted, lifted up his eyes and he saw Esau. You remember what Esau said to him when he ran from his father's house? Esau had told him that because of what you did, I'll kill you. All right. Earlier I talked about Esau as a man who could not hold his appetite. And because of that, that's how he lost his birthright. He came back one day. Good meal. If you didn't eat it that day, will you die? No. So even when his, his brother said to him, on one condition I will give you to eat. He said, okay, what is the condition? He said, ah, if you give me your birthright. He said, what is birthright? I mean, give me food. I said, but somebody wants to die. You are talking about uh, birthright. You can take it. He didn't know that he himself was changing the order of things. Because he couldn't hold himself. And say, no. Are you getting what I'm saying to you? Now, but back to this man. And when he sighted Esau from afar, hey, he became afraid. Because he felt, ah, Esau. I know what he said. And you know, when you read, the Bible says Esau had 400 men. If you have 400 men, you are not a small man. In some translation, it said 400 men. It refers to them as an army. So, in fact, at this point, if you look at it, Esau was richer than Jacob at this point. Jacob didn't have 400 men. This man had 400 men. You are feeding 400 able men and they will have wives and children. You are feeding a nation. So you know the man was wealthy. So that for people who think his father actually cost him. You now see that in the sense, that's not it. His father just brought him down and took Jacob above him. That's all he did. Because he said you will serve your brother. It's not a curse. It only means according to God's original plan, your place is to serve your brother. But you also put a clause there. The day you are able to break his influence over your life, you will be free. That was the day. The day came with a clause. Are you following me? Now listen to me. Eventually, he met Esau. Now, Esau was looking for Jacob to kill. But the one he found, he met at this point, was not Jacob. 
Israel. So you can't kill Israel, but you can kill Jacob. Jacob died. It's Israel you just met. That's why when he saw his brother, the Bible says, they hugged and they started weeping. What changed his heart? The favor of God is on him. You can't kill an anointed of God. Because the man has just been released. The man you used to know is not the man you are meeting. You are meeting a different person. The person who said you will kill God has already killed him. And that's why disjointed, you know, the whole of his die, tie. All right? God had to do that himself and kill. So by the time they met, the Bible says they hug. Why? Because God's hand was on him. And Esau was not planning anymore to kill him because the boy is meeting now is Israel. And that was the beginning of Israel's fulfillment. From now on, if you take time to read, you'll find out that God also referred to him as his God. God called you know, uh, Jacob or Israel after himself. So God said he's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and then the God of Jacob or the God of Israel. You know, anyone you want to call him. But that was when that happened. Now, that's what God wants to do today. God will be doing all these four at the same time. Now, this, this morning we came, if we're still in morning, okay, still morning, to release you into it. So, God will reset, God will induce, and God will release you, which means launch you, and when you are launched, you begin to accelerate. Nothing can hold you bound anymore. You remember what God said to him? He said, you are Israel. For you have prevailed with God and with men. Which means nobody can stop you. You are unstoppable. Nobody can hinder you. Not after now. Anywhere you go, when people are wondering, and say, who is this? People who you don't know will come to you to help you. At every point you need assistance, they will just come and say, here we are. Am I communicating? That can only happen to those who have prevailed with God and with men. Check the life of Jacob after now. You find out that things were different. Why? Because the blessing he didn't receive eventually came on him by the Spirit of God. That was what the angel came to do. And when the angel was about going, he said, what's your name? He said, mm -mm. Mm -mm. So he called the name of the place Peniel because I have seen God face to face. I thought he had seen God before. No, he saw God in a dream. But this experience is something I can take with me. That's what he say. I've never experienced God like this before. This is an experience. So he said in his own words, I have seen God face to face. I want to believe that as you go from here, things will all begin to happen together. In the name of Jesus. That the reason why God brought you this far is to establish these things in your life. And we trust God that he will do so as we connect with God today. Father, we thank you. Thank you because like Jesus said, the hour has come. The hour to reset Lord, the hour to induce and the hour to release your people. Lord, we trust to launch your people into the things that you have pre preordained, destined. You said what eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what has not entered into the heart of any man or the mind of any man, the things that you have prepared, destined, kept aside for those who love you. You said, but these things are revealed. By the Holy Ghost. We trust the Holy Spirit to reveal to us today. Thank you. For ministering angels again that are at work. Working in the lives of your people today. Reordering things. Resetting things. Inducing things. And Lord launching us. Into the things that you have made available to us. Thank you for acceleration in this season. We give you praise of glory and glory. In Jesus name. Amen.